What a do, cucks. It's your boy, the hater, up in this space. And it's time for another episode of Hater Outdoors. That's right, Hater Outdoors. The hater and his loyal dog, Ridge, were watching AW and Ridge fell asleep because he couldn't put up with all this nonsense. The hater, however, had a coffee and kept on going for the people. You know what I mean? So I watched the entire episode of AW, and I will say this. There was some bad, and there was some, some good. Uh, but the bad outweighed the good, as usual, with AEW. So let's get started and go through this segment by segment, cuckolds. Um, first up, the show starts out, and, you know, it's kind of boring already um, because John Moxley comes out. He's now fully bald. I don't remember the last time I saw him, but he's back. Tony Schiavone's in the ring for no reason whatsoever, and basically he's just saying, like, welcome to AEW. John Moxley, like, says, I'm going to go after Darby Allen, and then he, like, starts leaving the ring. Tony Schiavone then starts saying, oh, welcome to AEW. John Moxley comes back, looks at Tony Schiavone, like, all intimidating-like, and says, this is not your company anymore. And everyone's confused. I actually like this a little bit, you know what I mean? I have no idea what all he's talking about, but presumably it's going to be some sort of hostile takeover type situation, right? For better or for worse. The Blackpool Combat Club isn't really a thing anymore, you know what I mean? Like, like yeah, they're a thing, but it's mostly like Wheeler Yuta and Claudio Castagnoli, you know what I mean? Like, they're not really like a faction. John Moxley's doing his own thing. Daniel Bryan is in his own, like, you know, title matches. He's the world champion now. And it doesn't feel like he's part of the Blackpool Combat Club, right? Like, they're not all coming out together. Plus, the Blackpool Combat Club is stupid because they're like face one week, then they're heel the next week. It's hard to keep up and nobody cares. Um, next up, we go backstage where we have the very underrated Mark Briscoe, who's still the ROH champion as far as I can tell. And he cuts a promo basically telling us what's going to happen for the rest of the night. Mark Briscoe and the conglomerate, which is his group, um, along with Hook, are going to wrestle Roderick Strong, who somehow still has a job, and the Learning Tree, which is awesome. Um, but beyond that, he also says that uh, Tomohiro Ishii, who is already there, he's part of the conglomerate, he's going to be wrestling Adam Page. Now, Tomohiro Ishii, for those that don't know, is like a 50-something-year-old Japanese wrestler, you know what I mean? He's gotten a lot of respect over these last like eight or so years, but up until his 40s, he was basically a lower card pre-show jobber in Japan, right? He's about five foot five, you know what I mean? And he's like this stocky dude. But I will say, even though he's five foot five, or even smaller perhaps, there is a, be a believability about him. Like he has this face, you know, they call him the stone pit bull. It's a very fitting nickname. He has this face of a dude that doesn't fuck around. So it's believable, you know what I mean? That's another thing. You can have presence and be believable. You know what I mean? Like Brock Lesnar, Batista, obviously the two that I just explained, Hammerstone. Um, these guys have presence, but it's mostly due to their size. Some people just look intimidating. You know what I'm saying? And uh, Tomohiro Ishii is one of them. Nevertheless, the fact is what the fact is. And the fact is that he's been a jobber his whole career. So, of course, he's going to lose to Adam Page. Now, with that being said, I expect the match to be about seven minutes, but this is AEW, so the match is like 30, you know what I mean? Um, there were some notable moments in this match. First of all, Tomohiro Ishii, he did more in this match than he typically does, you know? He's one of these guys that gets like five-star matches by Dave Meltzer, but the match is just him and like, you know, Minoru Suzuki or someone else who's 50, just standing in the ring and trading chops. Like literally, it's like the worst thing you'll ever see in your life. But this match was not that. They actually did some moves amongst them, was Tomohiro Ishii picking up Adam Page and hitting the dead eye. But because Tomohiro Ishii is a jobber who doesn't know how to wrestle at all, like he just kind of like drops Adam Page on his head. Adam Page shows that he actually is a significant in-ring talent by tucking his head in at the last minute and saving his neck from being broken by this very dangerous maneuver. Then Tomohiro Ishii does a running clothesline like a lariat and it looks pretty badass. So you might think that's it, it's not. Adam Page kicks out, he hits the real dead eye, he hits the buckshot lariat and wins. After this, um, uh, Swerve Strickland comes out and basically he says, you, call, you cost me the title match, and he pretty much lays into Adam Page because Adam Page calls him a piece of shit. Strickland basically says, look, my career is on the rise, yours is up in flames. Deal with it, cuck. They set up a cage match for the pay-per-view, you know what I mean? Um, overall, nothing like to write home about here, um, both Swerve Strickland and Adam Page cut pretty decent promos. So I can't really hate on this segment as much as I'd like. You know what I mean? They cut believable promos, and there's this like 
sinister element to Swerve that I, I have to admire, right? Like, he has this laugh. It's like the laugh of a bad man, you know what I mean? So, he, he looks like a bad guy from The Crow. You know what I mean? He's dressed all flamboyant. He's, like, believable in that. So, I kind of enjoyed this segment, but what I don't enjoy is the fact that despite them talking about who's going to be champion and who's going who's gonna to be, re be remembered for longer as champion, the reality is neither of them is champion. And Swerve Strickland has a pretty good case for a rematch, but instead he's focusing on Adam Page. He could be doing worse things, so this is actually relatively believable. I got nothing against this, you know what I mean? Um, then we've got, uh, after this, uh, what do we have after this? Let me think about it for a second. Cuckold, Sims, and um, let's look at my notes here. Yeah, we had a Harley Cameron versus a returning Jamie Hayter. Jamie Hayter hits the Haterade. Uh, obviously, she's stolen the Hater's name. Jamie Hayter, the Hater. Coincidence? I think not, cucks. But anyways, jokes aside, Jamie Hayter wins. Nobody cares at all, you know what I'm saying? Um, after this, MJF comes out, makes his entrance, gets on the mic, and starts talking about how basically he revokes his U.S. citizenship. He only cares about Long Island, blah, 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 blee, blee, blee. He hates everything and everyone, basically, right? Daniel Garcia comes out and attacks him from behind. Daniel Garcia goes for a top rope pile driver, but the security save MJF. Uh, they brawl some more. Daniel Garcia goes for it again. The security and Christopher Daniels now save MJF, right? They keep brawling, uh, but for what this was, I actually enjoyed it. I can't believe I'm saying this. Daniel Garcia cut this short but very impassioned promo where you can kind of feel that he really hates MJF. This was great, you know? For Daniel Garcia, who is a vanilla jobber, this was a rare non-vanilla jobber moment. Despite the fact that he looks like a vanilla jobber, this guy goes to the gym once every three months probably. Um, but it is what it is, you know? There's a feud here, there's a reason behind the feud. Uh, MJF is somehow in a situation now where he's putting over young talent, I guess. Um, I don't care if MJF wins. If MJF wins, it's a complete waste of time. If Daniel Garcia wins, he gets a rub from MJF, but it's not going to lead to anything, so who cares? You know what I'm saying? There's also that factor, you know? Uh, likewise, MJF cuts a pretty solid promo in the ring, but it's already played out, you know what I mean? Like, I thought that the MJF American champion thing should have kept going a little bit longer, you know? MJF is also selling his neck injury after taking the Tiger Driver 91. So overall, for what this was, this wasn't totally horrible. But we have to remember, we're dealing with MJF, and Daniel Garcia here, so it can't be that great either. In my opinion, after this, um, I mean, I, I, I'm going to say that basically this is just the show just starts going more and more downhill. We have a completely meaningless eight-man tag team match. It's Cuck O'Reilly, Mark Briscoe, and Orange Cassidy, as well as Hook versus Roderick Strong and The Learning Tree. Now, in my opinion, any match that involves Jericho and seven jobbers, or I should say Jericho, Mark Briscoe and six jobbers, Jericho should win this match. Nothing is gained by the other team winning. Nevertheless, what happens is Hook makes uh, Roderick Strong tap out. Two problems with this. Number one, Roderick Strong had his foot on the rope, so it's a tainted victory. If you're going to do this, make this happen in three minutes. This was a long-ass match. So to have this long-ass match for a tainted victory is ridiculous. The segment ends with a brawl, and uh, the tag team champions, or the, I think they're still the... ROH Tag Team Chips, I'm not even sure. Matt Taven and uh, Mike Bennett, also known as Mike Kanellis, come out and they beat up Hook with Roderick Strong. Roderick Strong holds up the, the FTW belt, which is now being treated as a belt that people want for some reason, even though it's a joke title. Uh, during this segment, all I could think about was where the hell is Wardlow? Where the hell is Adam Cole? In addition to this, all I could think about is how is it that you have Brian Cage, a bona fide monster, and you're putting this crap on instead, right? Hook, I do like Hook, but honestly, several years ago when I was a fan of Hook, I automatically assumed that by now he would have gained some size, and he hasn't. He's just a skinny little twerp, you know what I mean? Hook is not intimidating at all. He's definitely strong for his size, but, you know, like, he's not believable. Neither was Taz, though, and here we are. So, you know, nothing crazy, nothing right home about here. I actually didn't like it at all. I thought it was really, really bad. Uh, Tony Schiavone comes out and introduces Mariah May. Mariah May basically says she's the champion and then takes off her. She's wearing like a little, like a little night, like not nightgown, but you know, like the thing that women wear. It's like a, like a robe almost, right? 
She takes it off and she's wearing lingerie underneath and has the, the women's title. They cut to like the audience where you see this fat dude and what appears to be his daughter and the daughter's covering up his eyes. That was pretty cool. That was a good shot. Uh, I enjoyed that, but otherwise not, nothing to see here. It's a complete waste of time. You know, like unless some, some, something's gonna happen, I don't know why we're even seeing this. Then we get one of the highlights of the show, in my opinion. We get to see a promo from the Grizzled Young Vets and we see another promo from the Grizzled Young Veterans. They have a new catchphrase. The catchphrase is, when you see the GYV, grit your teeth. They say it a little bit differently, but it doesn't matter. I've always liked the Grizzled Young Veterans. Um, and as a matter of fact, when they were paired up with Joe Gacy, who is now a lackey in the Wyatt family, I thought this was a huge step back because the GYV have this relatable gimmick, right? Now, I don't care about wrestling being relatable, but I do care about wrestling being understandable. In my opinion, there's two types of gimmicks that work, right? There's the, the first type of gimmick, where it's a gimmick that's not inherently obvious, right? Where maybe what you see is not what you get, right? So a good example would be the Dudley Boys, right? In my opinion, the Dudley Boys coming out with those glasses makes them look like jobbers, right? Especially back in the 90s, where they're both overweight, you know what I mean? And they're out there competing with like, you know, Farouk, Bradshaw, Billy Gunn, Val Venus, Godfather, people that are just like monsters of humans or that are in insanely good shape. So it's almost not believable that Devon and Baba Ray would beat, would have, even have a chance, I guess, a team like Bradshaw and Farouk, just based on visuals alone. But then the team kind of, if you will, circumvents your expectations, right? They look like jobbers, they look like two nerds, but in fact, they're these two hardcore badasses who like putting women through tables. That's a great gimmick, but you're not gonna be able to like discern that their gimmick is they're these two hardcore wrestlers who put women through tables just by looking at them, right? The second type of gimmick that works is the gimmick where you see something and you know exactly what's happening, right? You know exactly what they're going for. A great example, dare I say, is the undashing Cody Rhodes gimmick. Right? The undashing Cody Rhodes gimmick when he would, he would like be dressed like Phantom of the Opera, you can tell this is a Phantom of the Opera gimmick, right? You can tell likewise that the grizzled young, young vets, you can tell what they are in the name, in their appearance, in their demeanor, and in their promos. Uh, Zach Gibson, who in my opinion is the superior of the two, but I think in the ring, the guy with the long hair, uh, Drake, I think he's the better one in the ring. But Zach Gibson is really good at promos. This guy, first of all, he has that Liverpool accent, so they just feel like these two soccer hooligans, right? They just feel like these two good old English badasses, right? Type of guys that you don't want to meet in a bar because they'll beat your ass. You know, they're believable in that. They both look great. Uh, they have good physiques. And when they wrestle, they wrestle in that kind of style. They're basically like two Pete Dunn's, except they're not cruiserweight jobbers. They're bigger, heftier guys who have a Pete Dunn thing going on, but instead of having a mouthpiece and pretending they're Daniel Bryan, they're just these two smash mouth type guys, right? Also the name Grizzled Young Veterans, I like it, right? It, it, it fits them really well. So they cut a promo about how they're gonna have a match on Collision. Aside from the fact that they have great presence and they should be a good tag team, uh, nothing, nothing to see here otherwise, right? But they're a tag team where you can, you can just tell what's going on. Almost like Private Party, right? Like if, when Private Party comes out, nobody needs to explain to you what Private Party is, right? You, you understand what it is. It's these two guys that like to have fun and like to party, right? They like to get table service. There's these two young guys that like to have fun. That's their gimmick. It's not a great gimmick, but you understand it immediately. Versus, let's say, uh, Dante and Darius Martin, right? The top flight. Their gimmick is like they're just two Evan Bournes. You know, it's like, it's like Evan Bourne and tag, tag teaming with Evan Bourne. Like, nobody cares about that. It's not inherently obvious what it is they do. It's not even subtle what they do, right? They're just two guys that wrestle, and they like to do high-flying moves. Fantastic. Great. You know? So, I really enjoyed uh, this segment, even though it was a throwaway segment by every definition that uh, would, would make sense here. Next up, I thought, because they showed the little match previews at the beginning of the show, I thought we were going to see Ricochet versus Will Ospreay. So I'm thinking to myself, wow, they're really blowing their load this quick. That needs to be a pay-per-view match because it's the match that people are looking forward to. It's the match that Ricochet's going to have before he ends up on ROH jobbing to Wheeler Yuta. You know what I mean? That's like the only match people care about. So I was surprised to learn when the match actually happened that it wasn't Ricochet versus Will Ospreay. It was actually Ricochet versus Kyle Fletcher, also known as Bootleg Will Ospreay, also known as Titus from Final Fantasy X, also known as Meg Ryan haircut, also known as he looks like a girl sometimes. But anyways, it's undeniable that Kyle Fletcher is a really athletic kid. He's a good looking kid. There's something there, but the problem is that he's just another Will Ospreay, right? 
and they already have Will Ospreay. Like, this would work if WWE signed him and presented him as a Will Ospreay, like, as that kind of wrestler. But you have Will Ospreay, who on the card is presented as being far superior. So, after a hard-fought match, Ricochet hits the vertigo, which he hasn't done in a long time, and pins Kyle Fletcher. Then uh, Will Ospreay comes out, and he's about to cut a promo, telling Ricochet that Ricochet and him are going to fight, but they respect each other or whatever. Nobody cares. Luckily, we don't have to hear this because Pac comes up from behind. I think every time that Pac returns, I'm going to say in these videos, hey, it's Pac. So, hey, it's Pac. He comes around, and this was kind of silly, but he does a poison rana, like, on the, on the stage to Will Ospreay, right? It was just silly because he does it from behind. It's like a sneak attack. But instead of just belting him in the head, which would do much, way more damage in real life, he does a, a, a like, and it's also like, there's no risk because you can botch the hurricane run and hurt yourself, right? A nice forearm shiver to the back of the neck would do far worse, or at least the same. So he just pretty much does it, and he tells uh, Ricochet, get in line, Will Osprey belongs to me, I think they're gonna have a match as well, but who the hell cares, you know what I mean? Then, I thought to myself, this can't be the main event. And it, and it, it was, but there was another segment. The segment involves uh, everyone's favorite jobber, Daniel Bryan. Daniel Bryan comes out, uh, oh, it was Brian Danielson. I don't give a shit. I'm going to call him by the name that people might know him by. Daniel Bryan. You know what I'm saying? Daniel Bryan comes out and pretty much re re reiterates what he said at the press conference. Oh, I love this company. Oh, this was a great moment. Blah, 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 blee, blee, blee. He teases the retirement once again. And basically, he's now in a Ric Flair storyline. Once he loses the title, he's done, but he's going to give it his all to have a prolonged title match. I mean, title run, right? I mean, that's fine. If you're going to retire, this is one of the good ways to go out, right? And this is going to essentially ensure that whoever, whomever, I should say, beats Daniel Bryan for the title is also going to become uh, the guy that retires Daniel Bryan on top of becoming the new AEW champion. So they're setting up whatever it's going to be, right? Maybe at full gear, which is in November, I believe. That's probably a good enough run. Um, full gear is like their WrestleMania, as far as I understand. It's like the one where shit comes together. Um, whoever, whoever it's going to be, and that's the thing, it's like, I have no idea who it's going to be, right? But whoever it's going to be should be getting a massive push. Um, maybe it's going to be John Moxley, I don't know. Depends on where everything goes. This was a good show in the sense that we don't know what, what's happening, like, in the long term. But um, they took a page out of the haters' book and listened to the hater, basically. Uh, I'm not saying they really listened to my video, but you know what I mean. And didn't follow WWE's protocol. What I mean by that is this. Instead of having people do nothing, they're going to have people wrestle, right? They might be throwaway matches. The next pay-per-view is in like two weeks or even like in, yeah, two weeks, I think. Like not this Sunday, but next Sunday or next Saturday, whatever, September 7th. But the idea is they're not going to just sit around and scratch their balls, right? So to finish the match, Jack Perry uh, shows up on the Titan Tron, but it was a pre-taped segment. He attacks Daniel Bryan from behind and Jack Perry is the number one contender, you know? Even though Jack Perry has no chance of winning this title, everybody knows that, right? So he's a good opponent specifically for that reason, right? Jack Perry is a good oppon opponent only because we know he's not beating Daniel Bryan. And we know Daniel Bryan's not going to lose it two weeks after he won it without any buildup, right? But um, it, he's a challenger that, whether you like it or not, makes sense, right? Because he's the mid-card champion. So, like, he's like the other champion, basically, right? Now... The show was pretty good for what it was. I give it a 5 out of 10. However, I have to dock it one point and make it a 4 out of 10 because in my opinion, and I'm a little bit biased, so that's why they're only getting docked one point instead of my usual two. Um, Christian Cage, who, as everybody knows by now, is my favorite wrestler of all time. Christian Cage won the Casino Battle Royal, and he's the number one contender. So it might, maybe it's him who's going uh, to beat Daniel Bryan. Although I could see it being like someone beats Daniel Bryan and retires him, and then Christian Cage beats that guy, like cashes it in immediately, you know? Uh, I could see that happening. That'd be pretty nice. But the idea here is exactly what I just said. Uh, for better or for worse, um, Christian Cage should be on this show. I get it. He's a collision guy, essentially. But he should be on this show and cut a promo. Why? Two reasons. Number one, he won. He's, he's next in line, essentially, right? Uh, that's number one. Number two, Christian Cage is good at cutting promos. So this is how you utilize him, right? He's also good at wrestling, but you don't need him to wrestle every week because he's 50, right? And that's fine. His character kind of is like, he's a leader who, who has henchmen that do his dirty work, right? 
So you could have him come out and cut a promo or do something or at least otherwise acknowledge that Christian Cage won uh, the casino, whatever, gauntlet battle royal thing, right? Now, with all that being said, all that being said, why are you going to have this gauntlet battle royal when apparently all it takes is you show up, you ambush Daniel Bryan, and you're just automatically next in line? Why would anyone go through the trouble of winning the casino battle royal? I guess it's like... If your match is like a, I don't know how they treat it to be honest, like I don't remember. If it's treated like a money in the bank situation, which I think it is, because like last time that's how they did it for the TV title or whatever with Luchasaurus, where Christian Cage stole his title, like if it's treated like that, I'm cool with that, you know? That's cool, like that makes sense. You have to win a very competitive big match in order to get a very competitive uh, big opportunity, right? So it's just like it's just like the money in the bank in the sense that like, you know, you can win Money in the Bank, like Edge won the Money in the Bank, the first one, and then like a million people, including Edge, got title shots, right? But Edge still had the Money in the Bank, and we, you kind of knew that the Money in the Bank was going to be how he gets the title. So there's nothing wrong with that, in my opinion. But, um, you know, in order to put forward the idea that Christian Cage is now a big-time player, as he should be, by winning this match, he needed to be there, and he wasn't there, you know? Uh, maybe something happened, who the fuck knows? But what I do know is I didn't see what I thought was mandatory. You can make an argument that beyond the world title itself, right? I know that the Will Ospreay MJF match was presented as like the other main thing, but you can make an argument that beyond the world title itself, the Casino Battle Royal is the most important thing, right? It's like you can think of the, the pay-per-view as a random ass money in the bank. You know, beyond the world title match or matches that you may have at Money in the Bank, the next most important match is the Money in the Bank match. Right? That's the match that people care about because that match kind of predicts who's next, right? He or she who wins the money in the bank is going to get a huge opportunity and they're going to be pretty much pegged to be next in line to win the title. So with that being said, we didn't see this at all and that's not good follow through. You know what I mean? Like, I get it. Maybe Christian Cage is busy or maybe they have another plan. But, you know, a lot of people like me, for example... I've never watched one episode of Collision. I think I was at a random ass hookah bar once. I think it's on Saturdays, right? Or Fridays. So one of those days, whenever they show it, I think it was the first episode actually, I went to hookah bar, I completely forgot that it was happening, and they just showed it there and I watched the last match. You know, so it's like, a lot of people don't watch that. So, you know, you don't want that, you know, a situation where tomorrow or the day after, or next week or next month, or whenever, they introduce Christian Cage as like, you know, the next guy, and you're like, wait, what? You know, I missed that. I must have missed that, right? So that's a big problem, but, you know, it only gets docked one point for that. Um, the good segments involved some of the promos. Uh, the Swerve and Adam Page promo was great, uh, considering that. The MJF uh, situation was okay, but the Daniel Garcia promo, short but sweet but effective. And the Grizzled Young Vets. Everything else was garbage and filler, you know what I mean? So I think a 4 out of 10 is definitely uh, more than enough. You know, from now on, we're going to do a tally mark. We're going to compare Raw and AEW. That's what we're going to do. But we're not going to start it now. We're going to start it uh, this Monday and this Wednesday. This upcoming Monday and this upcoming Wednesday, I'm going to give a score to the shows. We're going to have a running tally, motherfucks, a running tally. And we're going to see in like, I don't know, by WrestleMania maybe, like by, you know, like, or maybe by the end of the year. I don't know. We'll see uh, who has more points. And then we'll reset the clock and kind of see who's winning and who's not winning, right? Uh, no ties. If there's a tie, we're going to do tiebreaker Tuesdays or some shit like that. But the point is, um, wrestling is um, watchable at this point, And I hope at minimum it stays this way. You know what I mean? Um, I don't care who wins or loses. I'm not one to think that wrestling is better or worse depending on who wins or who loses. Except for in the context of, of long-term storytelling, right? So Cody Rhodes, I don't care that he won the title. But the better match was Roman Reigns versus The Rock because... That's a WrestleMania match, and, you know, Cucky and Roman is, just isn't. So, there you have it. Cut colds, that being said. Um, I'll see you probably, you know, later today, because this is going to be the first video on, what, Thursday? So, you can probably get another video later today, cucks. Take care of yourselves, and fuck your moms!